The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Ebb, episode 745 for Monday, January 21st, 2019. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, your queries, your ponderings, all of those things, our queries, our ponderings, our cool stuff found. We mix them all together so that each and every one of us can learn at least five new things every time we get together here. Sponsors this week include LinkedIn Jobs at linkedin.com slash MGG and ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash MGG. We'll talk about what you get at those links and why you'd want to go there shortly, but you can visit them now. It's okay. For now, here in 3.4 degree Fahrenheit weather, Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, where we're lounging in a balmy 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, man, look at you go. That's right. This is John F. Brown. Yeah. Well, you know, we had a little we had a little snow this weekend. We had actually we had a lot of snow this weekend here um, and uh, and a lot of cold all around. And and I've got some of it left, some sort of a cough thing. So. Uh, yeah, we're going to rely on you to drive the bus today, John. So I don't know how that's going to go, but you know, that's how it's going to be. <laughs> sure. Wasn't any uh, CES uh, crud. Oh no, no, this, this came on far too late after CES for mm-hmm. it to have been that. Yeah, no, and this, this is a cough kind of thing that came on over the weekend. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel has a question though, and we're going to do our darndest to answer as many of these things as we can today before we run out of steam here. Daniel asks, do you know of a Mac OS app that would monitor disk usage and pop up a warning slash notice when the used or free space got to a set percentage? If not an app, is there another way to do this? Says it must work as a pop-up for me or something along the lines of an obvious alert because users cannot be bothered to monitor this on their own, as you likely know. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll go with that for now. Um, you know, so there's one app that pesters the crap out of me about this, but not in what I find to be a useful way, but that is drive geniuses, drive pulse. The problem is it's percentage based. So I think it's 10% of your boot drive. Once you're below that, then it's, that's when it starts warning you and you cannot alter that. So while it will do it, uh, it's not, you know, probably not. It's certainly not what I want because I, I would want something controllable. Um, however, that said, iStat menus will do exactly what you want. Um, you can go in to iStat menus into the notifications center and add a new. So this is the notifications tab or section, I should call it. Inside iStat menus, so not your system's notifications, although that's where they, it puts them. But if you go in there, you can there's all sorts of predefined ones, or at least there were for me. But uh, but if you go in, you can add a new one. And so I set one that said show an alert when my uh, boot drives free space gets below. And then I set 10 gigs. So it's like, OK, great. If I'm below 10 gigs, I got a problem. I, I want to be aware of it. I don't want to find out when I'm at two gigs. So uh, and, and again, the beauty of that is I set that. So if you wanted yours to be 100 gigs, no problem. Just set it to that. You're good to go. Look at that. Right? iStat menus is pretty cool. Been... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it shows you a plethora of sensor data, uh, which uh, which I love it for and we all love it for. But um, I had never really been in this notifications right. section. So you could, you know, like if you want to know if your CPU's temperature gets too high or if your processors are pegged for more than, say, 30 seconds at a time, that sometimes can mean a runaway process. You can have it tell you. Um, and, you know, if, if you want to know if your fan spins up to a, you know, certain point. Yep. No problem. You can put that in like. It's pretty flexible. I think you can do the fan thing. I know you can do the rest of them. I think you can do the fan thing. But certainly you can get a lot of useful information 
it, you know, like John, like you said, John, it it's always been great for what we'll call pull based information, things where you go to look and find it um, and even at a glance, because there it is right in your menu bar. But if you want it to get in your way when something critical happens or even non-critical, you can have it warn you about the weather, too, for that matter. Yeah, matter. I saw that. Yeah, that's default setting. Yeah. But, um, my friend, this brings up the question, though, especially when you're trying to calculate some number like the amount of free space. Yeah. Some may say that depending on what you do, that number is open to interpretation. Would, would, would you? <laughs> I'm just trying to lead us into our next question. Oh, well, exactly- well, you know, this is this is actually looking at how much space is used versus free on your drive. Right. So iStat menus doesn't guess around about this stuff. It doesn't do anything okay, to just fudge the, the data. The it's just. just- Looks at what the finder reports, I guess. Yeah, yeah. well, but probably not the finder, to be honest. It's probably looking looking using like mm. DU, the, the or DF, the Unix command, right? Mm. But yeah, it's it's just looking at the disk. It's not trying to interpret anything. It's just looking at the disk. But we have had some discussions recently on the show. Uh, it started with, uh, actually, you were having an issue, John, that uh, or you realized you were having an issue. And I, I clarify that for for a reason that will become obvious where when you went to the apple menu about this mac you go to storage and you let it sort of you know finish with its calculations and you had this system area that seemed huge and you couldn't figure out what it was and you were on uh you are on a mojave machine with this and uh and it reached the point so i kept data because always keep data if you're trying to solve a problem and at one point dave it was over 400 gigabytes. That's a lot. The system classification. And I'm like, what? And that's but sort what, of a, what, 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 what is it taking up that much space? Right. <laughs> and I know that in order to answer that question, you went and ran Omni Disk Sweeper, which has been long been our sort of go to for this stuff. Well, guess what, John? I ran into this, too on two machines. One was a high Sierra machine, the one here in the studio. And then the other one was my machine in, in the office. I saw the IM you sent me. And I'm like, yeah. And you're like now me too. And I'm like, welcome to the club. Dude. Yeah. Well, I think we're all in the club and what I've realized, and we'll explain what, what we learned going through this because the mystery is no longer a mystery. Um, those numbers are, are correct. They're, they're accurate and they're just not informative enough for, us geeks or really for anyone when they grow to be, you know, half your drive or a quarter of your drive or something like that. Right. Where it's like, OK, wh- wh- what is this? Because wh- and why is it so wildly different between, say, two different systems? So I started digging in and um, I, like you, the first thing I did was I ran Omni Disk Sweeper. And what I neglected to realize until I dug in more deeply was that Omni Disk Sweeper was not reporting the same amount of space used as the Finder was, or as you know this this thing in, in about this Mac was, and yeah. and so I you know what I did was I said well I I have to and I I had already done this part I know Mojave I know we have full disk access in Mojave right this thing where processes can't see the entirety of the disk unless they're in this group. So we go into system preferences and I think it's in security, but I'm not on a Mojave machine at the moment, but that's where it is. And you go and you add Omni disk sweeper to full disk access and still nothing. Then I ran Daisy disk and Daisy disk asked me to add it to full disk access, which I did. And also Daisy disk allows you right from the user interface to run a scan as administrator, which is what we do with the hack that we've done for years where we run Omni Disk Sweeper from the terminal. This is the problem. I, and I think you, John, had added Omni Disk Sweeper to full disk access, but we had not added the terminal to full disk access. And because we have to run Omni Disk Sweeper through the terminal in order to get it to run as root, It is subject to the limitations of that parent process. And so this is why Daisy Disk showed me the light long before Omni Disk Sweeper did. Once I got ODS 
you know, I'll, I'll call Omni to strip ODS so I don't have to keep saying it and bothering you with it. But uh, once I got ODS configured right in terms of permissions, it worked great. And that meant putting the terminal into full disk access, which is something that sort of made me feel a little sketchy because like I don't necessarily I, I kind of like being protected while I'm there sometimes. But anyway, uh, doing that did it. So digging in, though, with with first with Daisy Disk. The first thing I realized was that my drive genius logs were taking up over 20 gigabytes. And those were in home library logs, com, prostoft, engineering logs, drive genius, DP. It doesn't matter. It shows you. That's the beauty of, of these apps like Daisy Disk and Omni Disk Reaper, ODS. Uh, and I realized if you don't launch drive genius routinely, these logs just build up. Because I watched them disappear after I launched Drive Genius. And so I think it's, as I mentioned uh, when we were answering Dan's question, Drive Genius's Drive Pulse keeps these logs and it doesn't do anything with them until you launch Drive Genius. So by launching Drive Genius, I made tons of this data go away. So that was step one. That was really nice to find that. Um, another spot. Omni Disk Sweeper would not even see my mail library, which is why it was so far off from everything else until I, I did this fix, because, of course, my mail library is hidden or protected by full disk access or the lack of full disk access. Uh, digging in deeper, I realized that iCloud photo sharing um, causes your machine to keep tons of of things on the local drive, even if you, sh you store your photos library on an external drive, it, there is a folder and it doesn't matter where it is because you wouldn't want to mess with it directly anyway. But if you go into photos and, um, and check or uncheck the box for iCloud photo sharing, it, it either does or doesn't keep copies of all of those things locally for you. And of course that, locally is so that people can get to it if they are um if they're you know on the same network or whatever so uh by turning that off i also cleared out like another 30 gigs worth of space that was just being used on my drive and and not really being used so this started getting very interesting now of course your mileage may vary and you might have different specifics but by using the right tools you can now solve this mystery that's really not a mystery anymore uh, and honestly, you know, the nice part is Omni Disk Sweeper ODS is free, right? So if you download it and you run it the right way, we'll put a link in the show notes to the article that explains how to run it through Terminal so that it sees everything. But to do that, and the, I haven't updated the article yet, so bear with us. But to do that, Terminal now has to be in this full disk access thing. It's, it's very convoluted. Daisy Disk makes it way easier. It's a commercial product, right? Makes sense that they would go through the sort of the extra uh, steps of making sure you are alerted when things aren't configured the way they should be in order for Daisy disk to function the way it should. But, um, but yeah, there you go. It's craziness, John. It's craziness, but I reclaimed a lot of space and I, like I didn't reclaim as much as I wanted to. I was hoping that this, you know, 150 gigabytes of system that I was seeing on my Mac was somehow just like, you know, the like like the the log files for Drive Pulse, where it's just I'm just going to be happy to throw it away and everything's good. Some of it was like that, but most of it was like, no, no, it's it's like you here's your mail and uh, you know here's this. And it's like okay, yeah, actually I I do use a lot of space. Okay, that's fine, fair, good to go. Yep. So pretty cool, huh? Right, John? <sighs> Sounds like a bird's nest. It is. It is. Well, it's the whole system. And and that's why, like I said at the beginning of this, I understand why Apple sort of lumps it all together as system and leaves it. If it starts telling you it's your drive genius log file, like, but it's not going to tell you it's your drive genius log it would, files. It, just, it would just take them such, such a small amount of effort to allow you to see the detail for the system category, like every other freaking category in that dialogue. But what detail, that's what I'm asking you is where do they draw the line, right? What detail are they going to show you? Like, are they going to say uh, it's in the home directory that it's in? Uh, no. But I mean, they're going to break it down at, like again, to what level, how far is this going to go? Uh, I, I want more data than they give you now, which is none. 
Right. And <laughs> to do that, say, that's what Daisy Disk lives thing. for. I'm going to call a system, but right. I'm not going to tell you what exactly system is. You're just going to kind of have to guess. Well, or but, but the, to, <laughs> to your point, right, you, you're a power user that m- most people that listen to this show are power users of some degree or another. And that's what third party utilities are for. And thankfully, Apple has built a mechanism that allows third party utilities to see everything if you, the user, grant them that. Mm-hmm. So, like, this is what Daisy Disk is for. It's just we need to. And, and it's also what uh, ODS is for. We just need to uh, we needed to relearn how to use that properly in our new, you know, Mojave environment. Now With we the have additional protections. Well, we could call them restrictions. Yeah. Protections. protections. Well, yeah. they're both. Yeah. Right. They're both. It's exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 So Apple's just looking out for you. They want to make sure that you don't get hacked. Well, or okay. you don't get caught. So oh. they're putting all these, they're putting these things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, most utilities come up and say, hey, you got to, you know, the, there's this new thing called a uh, full disk access and uh, you, you got to do this thing. You got to do this thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy stuff. The, yep. the, the, the thing is, is that since I've been monitoring this value on my system, it has consistently gone down. And now it's like in the 200 gigabyte range, which which I can accept that. Sure. I, I believe that's a valid use of that drive space. But the 400 was crazy. And I, I wonder I how actually, much of that was your Drive Genius logs. Because I, I, my guess is you launched Drive I Genius. Delete, um, no, I, I, it would no, have dealt I, with it. The thing is, I did get rid of uh, what I eventually determined were very old um, iOS backups that were just like hanging out in wherever those things hang out. Yeah. I was just like, wait a second. There's like, uh, yeah, I think it was actually a subdirectory of either iTunes or iMazing, but sure. it was just stuff that was stale because I'm like, well, wait, there's like, you know, folders for like five different devices. I don't have five different iOS devices. So one of these must be from like an old device. And that, that I think eventually is what solved my problem is that sure. I, deleted it and it just took it a while it it doesn't and that's the other frustrating thing with this category it doesn't immediately tell you if what you did made any difference (laughs) or at least in my case it didn't yeah it's like i deleted like gigabit tens of gigabytes of stuff and the drive still says there's this amount of free space yeah the finder doesn't always update right away right right. i've experienced that too yeah for sure hey i want to talk about our first sponsor john which is express vpn at expressvpn.com slash MGG, which is where you can go to learn more about getting this awesome VPN service. In fact, I am happy and able to say that it is my favorite VPN that I've ever used. Uh, And you can get uh, three months for free, right? As part of your one year subscription. It's a pretty awesome thing that they're offering here. Totally costs less than seven bucks a month and is super easy to use. I, um, I installed it on my on my Macs and, you know, it was just like one, you know, one click and it's good to go. iOS, same thing. One click and it's good to go. I install it on my disk station as an open VPN thing. And that, too, was like they gave me a file. I uploaded it to my disk station. Done. Good to go. Super, super simple. And here's some cool things about this. In addition to their 30 day money back guarantee is that they have per app controls. So once you get this launched on your Mac, you can decide, hey, look, I only want ExpressVPN to block my or to to VPN to protect my browsing traffic. My my in fact, my that web browser like Safari or Firefox or Chrome or all three, but not my mail or not my terminal sessions that I want to be able to connect directly. Right. And you can either, you can either add things in or add things out. Right. So you can say, I only want it to be these, or I want it to protect everything except terminal, right. Or, or whatever app you want. And that can be really cool. Like I found that super helpful while doing some stuff. Sometimes I only want one browser to be protected by the, by the VPN, especially if I'm doing stuff here from home, I might want to, you know, test and do different things. Makes life really, really easy to be able to do this. And the app just works. Like I said, it's super, super simple. 
If you don't know what a VPN is, think about it this way. It's a tunnel that goes from your computer to the outside world so that anyone on your local network and your internet provider can't see what you're doing or where you're going. All they can see is that you've got a tunnel to ExpressVPN and nothing else. So when you're at coffee shops and airports and all of those places where you don't know who's there and you don't know who controls the network, now you can be in control with ExpressVPN. It's a very, very cool service, and I'm super stoked to have them sponsoring us and super stoked to be able to use it. You can use it too. Protect your online privacy and online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash MGG. John and I used this while we were at CES. It works. It's awesome. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash MGG for three months free with a one year package. One more time, expressvpn.com slash MGG. Our thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. All right, moving to Ben. John, shall we move to Ben? Right? Yeah. Ben's next. Yeah. All right. Uh, ben writes, he says, uh, I know, Dave, you bought a new Mac mini for your wife, and I have questions about your setup. Please forgive me if you have covered this. We haven't covered the questions you're about to ask. So great stuff. He says, I'm planning to upgrade my mid 2010 Mac mini, which is re reaching the end of its life. I upgraded it several years ago uh, with an SSD and it's still quite fast running high Sierra, but right now the SD card reader, the ethernet port and one of the SATA interfaces are all dead. So it will become, yeah, our, our family's new Plex and iTunes uh, uh, client attached to the TV downstairs. All my movies, iTunes files, but not server are located on a disk station. Actually, after the SATA failed, he says I even moved all my photos to the disk stations, moments and photo station, which I'm very happy with. But that's a separate thing, he says. Uh, he says, I'm thinking of getting the lowest spec Mac Mini, the 3.6 quad core i3 with uh, 256 gigs of an SSD. OK, yep. Uh, as I think this is sufficient for my means. But do you have any recommendations regarding monitors? My current monitor is an HD uh, 1080p monitor, 24 inch from Ben Q. He says, I bought it because it has a built in speaker, which is atrocious. Should I get 4K? I've heard some problems running some models with the Mac Mini. I guess I'm looking at 24 to 27 inches. Is there a monitor with a passable built in speaker as I want to avoid, avoid clutter on my desk? He says, I really only need the speaker for YouTube videos. All right. Well, so a couple of things. Um, I, I think relegating your mid 2010 Mac mini to the Plex and iTunes client is fine. Obviously it would be better if it had ethernet, but it doesn't. So I think you'll do okay. It's a shame that that's like the last Mac mini that didn't have Thunderbolt because you could replace, if it did have Thunderbolt, you could use like a Thunderbolt dock to replace those ports that died or not replace, but you know, add them back in if you will. Um, but that's not an option. So, Eight years is a good run. I it's think. a good run. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's still going to run for him, right? Like he's found yet another another job for it to do, which it is awesome. It makes me sad that it's slowly dying. I, I would almost say, I mean, using it as a client, uh, when I, I'm like, well, no, don't use it as a server. Right. Like but no, as a client, that's fine. Like, it, you know, it'll do its job until it doesn't. And then something else will do that job. And the bandwidth, even if you don't have Ethernet, is sufficient for streaming most stuff. Totally yeah. true. Yep. Now, I will say, kind of piggybacking on on your conversation here, John, or your comment that that eight years is a good run. I would strongly consider upgrading the CPU or going with a faster CPU in the new Mac mini. Not that there's anything wrong with that i3, right? It's a quad core CPU, but it's just four cores. It doesn't do hyper threading uh, to my knowledge. And I'm pretty sure I spicked all that out. Uh, and you know, it's 300 bucks to go from that all the way up to the six core i7, um, I, you know, I, like, and that six core i7 can actually hyper thread, which means for many operations, it can run an effective 12 cores. And that thing smokes, right? The only thing faster than that is an iMac Pro. So in terms of longevity, and you're clearly someone who keeps a computer for a long time and finds other uses for it, you'll never be able to change that CPU. So that's my pitch. 300 bucks, you know, there you go. Um, 
That's why I bought what I bought. Cause for what Lisa's doing, you know, she doesn't need the I seven. That thing's so fast. It's ridiculous. But anyway, I digress. Uh, those SSDs are super fast too. Like I'm getting, you know, thousands. I'm at what write speed is about 1500 megabytes a second. And read speed is like 2,700 or something. Oh it's yeah. Crazy. You showed me that. I'm like, wait, crazy. four digits. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I think most of us are happy if, if, Either of those numbers are in the low three digits. But, well, um, <laughs> maybe mid threes, but sure. Yeah. 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 For an SSD, I, I would say you expect that for, you know, rotational drives. Well, yeah, yeah good luck. Right. Um, <laughs> in terms of monitors. So I haven't really tested a monitor in terms of its speakers. I, I mean, I have tested a monitor with speakers, um, but uh, it, it, like... I've tested, I, I really like this monoprice UHD, you know, 27 inch display. Uh, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's out of stock right now. It sort of comes and goes. It's, it's either it's list price is three ninety nine. A lot of times it goes on sale for two ninety nine, and it's a great, great screen. The, the speakers in it totally suck though. So I, and I think you're going to find that with a lot of screens. So if someone out there knows though, if you have a recommendation, please, by all means, send it in. We'll pass it along to Ben feedback at MacGeekab.com. Of course. Did I hear you right, Dave? Did you say feedback at MacGeekab? Com. I did say feedback at Um And and again, I, I really like that. Say, mm, Go ahead. In, uh, in this area, the only thing I have to say, Dave, is uh, I don't know. I haven't done a lot of this. But even when I got my entertainment center, I was like, the TV is not the device that I want my speakers in. <laughs> right. I think you're much better off to provide your own solution, whether it be, you know, like a nice set of audio engine speakers, which are kind of, you know, they have a small version. I understand the concern for space, but you, yep. I mean, come on, you want to get there. Or, uh. Well, it, for that matter, um, the Mac mini has its own speaker in it too. And, you know, Lisa, <laughs> Lisa, no, seriously, Lisa didn't want a, oh, no, a set of speakers my, my on her desk. Too. And it, 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 it's, it's adorable. Fu- it's fine. She like she's been using it for for exactly what you're yeah. what you're talking about. So, uh, so you know that that actually may solve your problem, and then it of course opens up all sorts of options for you. Um, that said, I did want to make sure you know you had said that you've got a 1080p screen. That Mac Mini, as with most Macs these days, will support. Well, well, there's many terms that are thrown around. Apple calls it retina, right? Um, the the TV industry calls it 4K. Um, the computer monitor industry calls it UHD. And when we're talking about screens in the size that you're saying, 24 to 27 inch, uh, any of those terms would communicate that the screen has a pixel density big enough that you'll get, um, uh, you know, that retina view where, where you're getting pixel doubling and, and the, the text looks, you know, like you're not seeing pixels anymore. And it's, it's all very, very beautiful. Um, so you might not want a 1080p screen on that thing. If you can find a monitor that suits your needs, that is UHD, which is what the industry calls it. And the, the monoprice display that I mentioned is UHD. Another one that I'm looking at testing is the new uh, ViewSonic. They call it the VP2768 4K, which is the same sort of thing. It's it's 3840 by 2160 resolution. And that's what you're looking for in a 27 inch display in order to get that retina experience Um for lack of a better term. So that that's worth considering as you, as you do this, because it really does look beautiful when, when you're able to do that and, and not have to see pixels anymore and any of that. Uh, so, well, you have to see pixels. The thing is you want to see as many as possible. Mm. You don't want to see the edges of the pixels, right? You don't want to see the separation between them. You just want to see, you know, this, this, this seamless thing. And that that's where it really gets beautiful. So, um, right. But, um, Looking at Math Tracker, the uh, yeah, the chipset in the latest Mini absolutely supports uh, either one or more 4K displays, depending on the configuration. That's, so that's right. Cool. Yeah. Now they're not they're not going to be the fastest. Like it's got it's a built in it's Intel's built in um, you know yeah, graphics. UHD. 
six thirty. Yeah. Uh, but still, it's a well, it's better than the other. It's better than the ones in prior machines. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, for sure. But you know, that's also the beauty of this new Mac Mini is that you add an eGPU to it, and mm. now it's you know a monster, and you can still do it for way less than you would spend didn't on I an iMac Pro. On, uh, didn't I see something on Mac Observer this week about, uh, or, or was last week about um, the release of some eGPU? E I'm like sure you did. We, yeah, we talk about it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were tons of them at, at CES. Um, the, you know, OWC's got a great uh, eGPU chassis that oh, they can put different eGPUs into. And it and you're t you're looking at like the chassis itself is is only I think it's two ninety nine or something. And then, you know, you can add a, a, a graphics card to that, obviously. And it's Thunderbolt three and it's fully supported and all of that good stuff. So, again, you know, you get this machine for well, with the two fifty six gig drive, the i7 chip in the Mac mini is twelve ninety nine. And then you add the eGPU and a card and you're still probably at less than two grand. Uh, and then you add a monitor and you're still at less than th less than three grand. And the iMac Pro starts at five grand. So is the Mac mini the new Mac Pro? For most people, I think that answer is yes. Well, yeah. For most people, I think I, that I'd be yes. uncomfortable with the 256 gig internal ssd though I, I just want more just because both of my machines right now have one terabyte ssds well so here's my argument though of course, Why? Pay, of course i'll pay the money on the other hand this has screaming fast ports so right maybe just put maybe just boot off the internal ssd and maybe and, and store all your media and your documents and all those external things you, you put that on external or not even if you want to get it with the 128 gig ssd and get a much faster external or not much faster much larger external ssd that you put somehow on a thunderbolt 3 bus and now you know you just boot off that forget about the internal one if you want like it's a mac mini you're not taking it somewhere most of us aren't taking it somewhere so yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah. good uh, yeah i went but i came back Right. That's right. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, well, welcome back, John. It's good to have you back. Yes. Uh, let's see. Moving on to Julian, who was having some trouble with mail. Julian writes, uh, I have an ongoing issue with my mail app that doesn't regularly let me search for items. I typically file everything into one single folder and then search for mail by sender or title to access things. A system that has worked well for uh, years, but now I'm forced to keep a Gmail browser window open every time I need to find something. The search within the browser, of course, works perfectly. I'm running just two different Gmail addresses and have approximately 20 gigs of mail in each of them, with the majority of each in just one folder per account, an archive folder. Since this has started, I've upgraded the operating system and rebuilt the mailbox and spotlight index, as well as doing a complete Onyx maintenance run. Whenever I rebuild the spotlight index, the search starts working again for a few minutes and I think the issue is resolved, but then within about a half hour, everything stops working again. I've been told that the issue has to do with me keeping too many messages and attachments on my computer. Since in my personal account, I still keep mails uh, dating back 10 years. I'd be happy to archive them if I could find a straightforward way to do that. But uh, I wanted to ask you guys first. Okay, so this is this is strange. I like I have way more mail than Julian on my system. As I mentioned, when we were talking about space, I have a hundred gigs of mail on my computer and I am able to search all of it. Uh, no problem. It lives in two Google apps accounts. So Gmail accounts, and then also in a local archive in my, on my Mac folder. And I've never had any problem like this. And my mail goes back way more than 10 years too. So I don't think that's your problem. Uh, Julian, I obviously though, something in there, is the problem. And it's almost seems like maybe you've got some corruption that is stumbling the uh, spotlight process here, right? Because it spotlight goes through indexes everything. And then that's what's used when you're, when you're doing your searches. So it seems like maybe there's some, some data corruption in, in your mail index or something that's throwing it off. I don't know. What do you think, John? I mean, yeah, rebuilding things is always a good strategy. And I think, uh, I don't, did you mention, I, I, I was fiddling with something else. I'm sorry, but Onyx and other utilities. He did, yeah, there, there he various, uses Onyx. He yeah. mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. So there are various utilities you can rebuild. 
Oh, it's interesting though, because I mean, you got to, so you got two indexes or indices. We, we talked about this before, whatever. Um, so you have Mail's internal one, and then you have Spotlight. And I'm actually now scratching my head over the overlap between the two. I mean, if you do Spotlight, it'll find Mail stuff, but how much does that rely on the data that? mail generates do you see the question that i have here i do maybe kind of crazy but um <clears throat> i mean the answer is rebuild both or rebuild all of them and then right. maybe you'll find all your stuff again because yeah as you pointed out a damaged index and you know especially with email i mean i've had this and i think you've had this too is especially when you're migrating email from one system or one provider to another is some of them are just I remember this trying to transfer, like do, doing a huge ma email copy from one server to another yeah. usually comes yeah. up. It, it uh, I've never had one complete successfully. It's like, Oh, invalid character or null character or this or that, because something got corrupted and it's too dumb to get past that point. Huh? I I've always done it using IMAP, right? Where I just, I move things from yeah, one yeah. and and then IMAP sort of just deals with it. It, which has seemed to work great. Yeah, maybe it was when I was migrating my old pop stuff. It, that's possible, still, sure. Yeah, but I still remember with IMAP, I still had uh, my strategy would be to migrate small. Uh, don't try to do the whole enchilada or burrito or whatever <laughs> spicy food you like to have here. I'm getting hungry. It's almost dinner time. Okay, <laughs> but um, I found the transferring especially transferring email from one world to another yep. is best done in small chunks. So say you got 10,000 emails, maybe you just want to copy a thousand at a time or, or however many. Right. I don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 Well, but uh, yeah, in, in this scenario, uh, yeah, I, I wonder. So here's an idea. You mm -hmm. have everything stored in Gmail, which means it's all on the server. In theory, and you would make a backup before you even listen to my instructions, but make a backup locally. Then, in theory, you could wipe out your entire local mail store, reconnect to your Gmail store and slurp down another, you know, 40 gigs of mail. I would do this one mailbox at a time and see if the problem gets solved. And if it does, then, you know, the problem was in the first one, not the second one. Uh, but that way you're pulling down all new messages Mail is pulling them down the way mail wants to pull them down to John's point, right? Where, you know, there's, there's different ways of storing it. Maybe something didn't get migrated properly or whatever, but now you're just pulling them down with IMAP. It mails doing what it wants to do. It's saving them. And maybe that's the answer. So wipe out all of your mail accounts and, you know, or one at a time, but you could do, you could do all, uh, it will take some time to slurp all that back down from, from Gmail. Of course, but this might be the way to do it. Again, I can't stress it enough. Back up first, because otherwise, no bueno. So, I think you said people should make a backup. Did I hear that right? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Right. Yeah, good. So I like that. I, I don't know the answer. I, and it's interesting. We've got somebody in the chat room that is uh, that is saying they're having the, the very same problem on uh on a sierra machine believe it or not so I, it, it could very well be that that's just what you have to do and i've done that before you can do it on a mailbox by mailbox basis choosing rebuild mailbox from the the mailbox menu in mail um but that doesn't necessarily wipe everything out it it, it gets most of it but if you really want to do it that would be the way to do it so yeah good john yeah all right yeah yeah, um, I think I had to do that once. Okay. I think for, for a while I was forwarding my Google to Yahoo. And then I'm like, why am I doing that? That's silly. And I just started from scratch. And I said, you know what? Just blast there. Because, yeah, as you pointed out, the, the one maybe somewhat kind of disconcerting thing, but maybe a good thing is that Gmail saves everything forever. Gmail yeah. saves everything forever. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it may be right. Unless you've gone in and deleted things, in which case it does not save everything forever. And so you just need to be aware of that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Hey, yeah, but I think you have oh. to do like the double secret delete, don't you? 
or maybe not. Where uh, in Gmail? Yeah. No, if you delete something, it goes to Gmail's trash. Where after thirty <gasps> right. days, oh, yeah, or, nine, or is it ninety? Or like I, I think you can set it. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, no, it'll it'll go away if you archive it. But there, you're right though. There, like Gmail's all mail folder does keep more things than you might expect it to. Um, but it, you know, we have. I'm trying to think if it's if I queued it up for this show or not. Where is it? Maybe not. Maybe not. I'm going to I'm going to use search here. Mm, yeah. I in fact I I will I will use I will use this opportunity to go to Mike's tip here um because listener Mike shared with us uh an issue that he was having with Spark but it also applies to uh Gmail and Mike says uh I've come across a feature in Riedel's Spark Mail app for Mac OS and iOS that despite having used and tested it for over a year, I did not appreciate the risks of their threaded only approach. Uh, he says, perhaps I'm alone and perhaps everyone knows this already. And he shared uh, a text uh, a, a support, the thread of the text thread of a support message that he sent to Riedel, where he says, once a year, I go through my emails and delete any I don't really need. He says, I did that last weekend, including going back through the thousands of sent emails I built up during 12 months, including those duplicate emails forwarded to my wife. Not job done. Nice, clean, sent mailbox. Yesterday, he says, my wife asked me what time our upcoming upcoming flight to New York is. I opened that trip's folder and to my surprise, it held just a few emails. All the important stuff was gone. I recovered them from a backup. He says, then I got to work to find out why they'd gone AWOL and came up with a 100% way of knowingly, of unknowingly deleting important emails in Spark. And this has to do with their threaded approach. Number one, receive an email in your inbox. Number two, forward that email to someone. File the received email in a folder is number three. Number four, delete the forwarded email from the sent mailbox. Because the forwarded email is attached to the thread that has the main email, both were deleted. He says, and I was gone. I went back to my filed email in its folder and it's not there. I've run into this deleting things in Gmail uh, on the web before, too. But my guess is if you ran mail in threaded mode, you could also get yourself into this problem where when you delete one email associated with a thread, everything goes. Um, I was deleting things on in Gmail. I was doing a search to delete things that were old, like this guy was uh, Mike. And it wound up deleting new things that were part of that same thread. And that's not so good. So beware of that folks. That's, um, that's a, you know, it's a thing we got to think about, right, John? Yeah. I don't think I ever ran into that thing. Yeah. <clears throat> well, if you're not deleting mail in Gmail's web interface, then you, you would not. But if like me, I, you know, I have a couple of accounts that, that don't have a ton of storage on Gmail and I archive things, you know, more than several years old off. And, uh, and then I have to go into Gmail and delete what's left or, or those messages once I've moved them because Gmail doesn't right, just right, doesn't do mail right. doesn't take care of that. Yeah. So of course I'm a relic and I run mail in classic mode. Oh, same classic view. Yeah. I like to see all my messages. Yeah. Where you can, you can have the multi paned approach, right? so that you mm -hmm. can, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I, I think there's a lot of us that do that, but maybe it's because we got used to it the old way. We just can't change. The change is bad. I want to talk, uh, John, about our second sponsor here, which is LinkedIn Jobs. We're at linkedin.com slash MGG. You can get 50 bucks off towards your first job post. I can tell you from experience that hiring the right person makes all the difference in the world. Hiring the wrong person makes even more of a difference to your company. And it really, really matters to get enough people when you're looking to fill a position in order to make sure you select the right one. And oftentimes the right person isn't necessarily looking for a job. So how do you find them? If someone's not looking for a job, they're not posting, they're not searching on job boards, right? They're doing the job they already have but they're probably open to a new opportunity. And if they are being kept in their existing job, they're probably pretty good at what they do. Well, here's the trick. Here's where LinkedIn has a leg up on everyone else because 70% of the U S workforce is on LinkedIn because it's 
a place to go share things. You can share articles. You can interact. It's, they've, they've got a social network component in addition to just tracking your resume, right? There's reasons to be on LinkedIn every day. And lots of people are, including people that are open to new opportunities, even though they're not actively pursuing finding a new job. So on LinkedIn, you've got people that are qualified for your role and are ready for something new. And it's the best way to find the person who will help you grow your business. And that's why a new hire is made every 10 seconds on LinkedIn. Here's the trick. You can hurry to linkedin.com slash MGG and get 50 bucks off your first job post. I have posted and found someone by spending less than 50 bucks. So this 50 bucks actually might mean something for you. And you might be able to do everything you need to do right within that 50 bucks. So again, that's linkedin.com slash MGG to get 50 bucks off your first job post terms and conditions apply as they always do. LinkedIn.com slash MGG are thanks to LinkedIn for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, uh, we promised last week that we would have a conversation about APFS and external drives and disk utilities and all that stuff. It's one that we've been sort of uh, carrying along with us in the agenda for quite some time, and it is time to do it. Shall we, my friend? No, no, no. Okay. Well, okay. All right, good. Uh, I will start with going to, uh, to Mike, different Mike, who says, hello there. I'm now on Mojave with all my Macs. As I'm reformatting some of my external drives, I'm getting different options. For instance, I have two identical 4 gig Seagate Backup Plus drives. When erasing one of them, I'm given four APFS options, i.e. case sensitive as an option and encryption as an option. So four when you put them all together. When erasing the other one on the same iMac, I'm given those four options plus the four options for Mac OS Extended, MS-DOS FAT, and XFAT. Ten options total. What's the difference and which would you recommend? Is it okay for APFS to be used on external rotational hard drives? Okay. Um, so here's my question. Um, I, when I, you know, I went through this on my Mojave Mac and I, I only have one external drive there, but I do see the 10 options that, uh, that, that you talked about here. Um, so I, I'm curious if that Seagate backup plus drive is already formatted as an MS DOS drive. And here's my theory, John. Um, the reason that we're seeing HFS plus and APFS options on those drives is because they're already formatted as HFS plus. But for drives that are not formatted HFS plus, either APFS or FAT or something, we're just not shown that anymore. Uh, and that would be interesting to me. So I'm curious. Do you have, John, do you have an external drive that's formatted APFS these days? On Oh, yeah. And if you go to reformat that, don't reformat it. But if you go to reformat I'm it. I'm doing it as you speak. Because you and I show are the options. so in tune. Yeah. So I'm looking at my mini. I have a thing called one terabyte Mac mini backup. Okay. And Fair. I'm going to go to erase, which yep. I know. Yep. Be careful. And yep. uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to say race. Right, right. right. We, Fortunately. Don't, we don't want you to. Fortunately, you're, yeah. So here we go. So, um, oh, I only have four options. Aha, APFS. because it's an APFS That's it. drive. That's it. So if the drive is HFS plus formatted already, you can reformat it as HFS plus. But if it's APFS, you can only format it as APFS. Now, let me, let me dig a little Here's deeper with you. It, it, are yeah, you clicking I'm, I'm, on the are you clicking on the volume or the drive itself? Well, I'm clicking on the drive itself, but okay. what I decided to do, which I think you were leading towards, is I clicked on partition and it says, "Oh, Apple file system space sharing," which right. is like, "What?" Yep. Well, that's no, that's that's not what. That's how APFS works. That's a that's a great question, yeah, I've, right? I've, I've never delved into this part of it other than formatting the entire external drive to accept the backup. So I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. And then there's a partition button, in which case. You could add another partition. Probably, yeah. 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 But it's all taken up here. So. Well, but the, but that's see, that's the thing about APFS, though, is it really is just a blob of data. And mm -hmm. if you were to add another partition, it would it would happily or if you were to add another volume, 
it would actually ask you, do you really truly want to partition the drive or do you just want to add a volume to this drive? And you could choose and just I clicked to- on that and I now get the spinning wheel of death. Nice. Right. Nice. Let's but that, that but that's what it'll let you do. Is- I'm going to I'm going to try to quit this utility. I would, I would give it I would give it 30 seconds before you uh, before you force it to. No, I'm going to gonna force quit. Okay. And I know what I'm doing. And <laughs> still here. So, so let's not mess with that on the podcast. Machine. On the, yeah, right. No, that makes sense. Uh, but that's that's what it's asking you is, do you really truly want to carve the drive up into separate partitions or do you just want to have another volume that's also within this APFS blob of storage and we'll let we'll let the file system hand, and Mac OS handle it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I, I'm curious, though. So I think we've answered Mike's first question. His second question is. Essentially, do we trust APFS on external drives? How has how has that been going for you, John? Uh, I, as I think I told you, I have two SanDisk, one terabyte, three D are they or whatever they call them these days? Mm-hmm. But they're really nice SSDs, and I, on my mini, it, auto, it automatically does a backup every every day yep. or every morning, yeah. and on. My uh, MacBook, I, I do the same thing, same drive, um, and I do that manually every uh, Sunday, usually. Sure, and and, and these are don't. you've got these formatted as APFS, correct? Okay, and they're but they're SS, they're not rotational drives, they're SSDs, right? Right. So okay. both, so the internal drive, uh, the boot drive in both my MacBook Pro and my Mac Mini are one terabyte. I think it's a Micron M five hundred. Okay. Back in the day, it was great. Sure. Well, it's still great. I mean, it's working great. Uh, the thing is, it costs about twice as much <laughs> when right. I bought them as they do now, because <laughs> prices is very. So, do you down. have any rotational drives that are APFS formatted? Not anymore. Okay. No. How no, did I decided it, to move away from that? Yeah. It, it, I've heard. I've heard mixed reports. This is why I'm asking, and why I wanted to share with our listeners. You know. When you moved away from that, had you still been having trouble on a on a regular basis, or had that trouble sort of settled in? No, no. Uh, okay, I don't think APFS on a rotational drive, uh, but I didn't notice any difference between. Uh, actually, if anything, I probably noticed more problems. <laughs> Like this whole system nightmare, I've sure. probably noticed more problems with APFS on SSDs than I have on rotational drives. To so. be fair, that system nightmare has nothing to do with it being uh, APFS no, or an SSD. It's just, no, it just that's just Mojave. It's, it's yeah, just something I'm going to blame on. Yeah, yeah, Mojave. Yeah. <laughs> Although you will, like I said, I experienced it here in the studio with uh, with High Sierra. Exactly the same scenario. It's just. I was able to very quickly find what was taking up that space because full disk access did not get in the way of that. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's very interesting though, because if I go to my MacBook pro, which also has the micron M 500 inside, though I'm looking at a different drive, but if I look at the internal drive and I say erase it, it will show me both the format and the scheme. Okay. Right now it's GUID. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Mac OS. And you should be able to see that for your external drives too. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on to Joe, uh, who asks a very good question. He says, uh, Hmm. I thought I had heard you mention disk utilities in a recent episode that were APFS aware. Uh, But he says, in looking back, I can't find it. Am I dreaming that one was mentioned? So here's uh, here's the thing. I I looked and Disk Warrior says that uh, Mojave is recognized but um cannot be rebuilt at the moment and i think i don't think that has changed uh yeah recognized but not able to be rebuilt is still what it says on their website as of the moment that we're doing this show uh the good news is that drive genius uh have you used Drive Genius with with APFS, John? Their website indicates that it can do all kinds of great things. I have not tested it yet, though. Uh, I think I ran a scan a little. I haven't had an occasion to actually use it as of late. Okay. So, uh, have you run it? Uh, have you run it when you're pretty sure you were using APFS? It's. It seems like they've had this. This. Oh, no, I, I, I think I ran yeah. it once. Okay, and I'm good. like, yeah, do a check, and it's like, yeah, sure, whatever. Mm. Um, no, it seems they got over that. And then Carbon Copy Cloner sort of 
kind of uh, their support. Well, but they, whoa, 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 hey, slow down, slow down, slow down. I don't want to stop. Stop talking. Um, the carbon just mentioning com- it John because they cannot my hear me when I moved over. All right, to John, we're going to we're going to pause the show. Carbon copy clone. All right. So the reason I, uh, I was trying to interrupt you and you couldn't hear me, but we've solved that now. Right. You can hear me now. We're good. Yes. OK, sweet. Hello. Yep. Good. Uh, was that I did not want to confuse. You started talking about carbon copy cloner, which is great and certainly has lots of great APFS related stuff. However, it is not a disk utility. So I did not want to confuse our listeners right. that right. Okay. The, the only two sure. that they are the only one that I know of. And I tested it, too. And, and Drive Genius does seem to work with APFS. But that's the only third party disk utility in terms of like repair utilities that uh, that I've seen work with APFS. Have you found any others? Well, this utility kind of. But that's not third party, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, disk utility is is uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's we may get to this question, but but I, I saw a screen that looked very similar to a screen that I saw, including reporting errors with my APFS volume, which made me sad. Okay, right. Uh, I, I yeah I, yeah okay. I believe you that you got sad. Yes. <laughs> Um, I, there, there was something though that you were discussing with carbon copy cloner. So what, go ahead and, and, and take us back down that path. Now that, now that we're back in sync. Here. Oh, the only thing I'll mention is the difference is that APFS uh, is that they now support APFS snapshots, which is weird, but it, it operates in a different fashion from safety net. And oh, actually, very much so. I'm yes. not very happy with it because safety net. So safety net was a feature where it's like, all right, if you delete a file, I'm going to put it in the special folder. And if you need it back later, um, because you deleted it accidentally, we'll we'll get back to you. The thing is, that had a threshold. And the thing is, it would clear it out or make enough space available before it did a backup. It doesn't really do that quite as well if you're using APFS snapshots to store your prior system states. At least I found that, is that I've had a report. It's like, oh, um, yeah, you ran out of space. And I'm like, well, but I told you like to clear out enough space like to handle the next backup. And it's like, well, yeah, sorry, but I, I couldn't figure out how to do that. So it's like... Right. So snapshots are are really just storing the the delta between where the system Mm -hmm. was and where the system is. Um, And that can change over time. Right. So that's where it gets very interesting. It can be really handy. And, and carbon copy cloner, I found super handy as I was digging through this issue of finding where my space is being used. That's one place that it can be is it can be in Mm -hmm. those APFS snapshots, either the ones that carbon copy cloner itself creates or the ones that are created by uh, time machine locally on your system. And you can yeah. use carbon copy cloner to see and, and even better manage those. And it'll show you how much space they're taking up. And, and then you can choose to delete them, you know, one by one or, or all at once or however you want to do it, mm-hmm. which is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah. We've got one more and I, perhaps this is what you were alluding to John with, yes. with listener Don here about uh, an issue that he saw on an APFS volume. He says, uh, where is it here? Both my brand new refurbished late 2017 MacBook Air and my late 2015 27-inch iMac have begun to exhibit perplexing error messages when I run disk utilities first aid on the built-in SSDs of both computers. Any idea what the problem is? I've been in touch with Apple support and got no joy. And he showed us some screenshots that you were talking about that have uh, things that say warning inode value object uh, invalid BSD flags as it's going through and checking each of the snapshots. And uh, so um, I'm curious and we've talked about this on the show several times, but I'm curious if these drives uh, were upgraded from high Sierra and therefore migrated to APFS from HFS plus and not just formatted as APFS, because as we've mentioned here, we've seen an increasing number now that we're, you know, at a year plus with a lot of these migrated drives, we're seeing an increasing number of reports from all of you folks saying that, you know, just weird problems with these drives. And a a lot of them have been solved by clone the drive, reformat it fresh as APFS and put the data back on. And I'm, I'm wondering if that in fact is Don's, um, 
Don's problem and perhaps solution here. What do you think, John? Did he, ah, he didn't put it in his uh, screenshot. Bummer. Oh, no, no, no. Here we go. Uh, the volume Macintosh HD was formatted by new FS, APFS, and last modified by. So wait, no. So he wasn't migrated. He okay. wasn't. Oh, right. Because disk utility will show you that. When it says well, I'm looking it. at the line here, so it'll either say the volume was formatted by, or it'll say migrated. Yes. His, his line says formatted. That's so, true. So that is not mm. a fail vector. I just, I'm glad he put that screenshot. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. So here's, here's, a, that that's true. You can see this in disk utility and you can see it when you, um, I think you can see it in system profiler too, if I'm not mistaken. Oh. Huh. Um, yeah, I, I know there's another place to see this. You don't have to run disk utility to see it, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you do. Maybe I'm just dreaming that up, but I mean, the I solution mean, running here, you could run FSCK. Well, which uh, is just all, which utility. is all disk utility is doing. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I, I wonder, I, I still would maintain that the solution may still be the same, Right. Disk utilities, including Apple's disk utility, but also, you know, we just mentioned that Drive Genius is able to see and repair these disks. But, you know, we don't have 20 years of history or 20, 30 years of history with the file system. We have like three and really not only one year of widespread usage on a Mac. So, like, it would not surprise me if for a while the best answer or perhaps only answer to solving these you know pesky little problems is clone reformat restore um until we get utilities that are mature and have you know and we've just had enough experience with okay here's how you fix this issue great file that away put it in there here's how you fix this issue okay great file that away put it in there and then and then that's how these utilities i mean it's it's all sort of not trial and error but but one by one, here's a scenario. Great. Here's how we fix it. Okay, cool. Here's how this works. Here's how this works. I, I think that I think that might be his answer, even though he wasn't migrated. John, what do you think? <sighs> I don't know. Okay. Okay. Fair. I just <laughs> fair. Starting from scratch is just always a unpleasant option. For well, but, but I'm not talking about starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. It, it, the, the idea would be clone the drive, reformat mm -hmm. it, restore from the clone. You're back to exactly where you were. You just have a new, fresh format. That's all. Right. But in a sense, it is starting from scratch and that you're destroying something in place that didn't work right. So, yeah, reformat it. No, I'm, I'm with you. You know, I mean, I, like, I, I haven't felt a need yet. And both of my drives are migrated and I haven't yet felt, uh, despite seeing some weird things. I mean, like I had one time where... I think I rebooted into recovery and it showed like volume names that were not the names of my discs. Sure. It's like some weird Unix low level code. And I'm like, Oh, that's really bad. Yep. And I rebooted and everything's great. Good to go. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It still gives you those little jolts of panic every now and then to say PFS. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, you like it, it. There's some great things about it, but you absolutely need to have, uh, backups because you know, we just don't, we just don't know enough to truly trust mm. it or how far to trust it. I or, don't, I don't truly trust it yet. No. Or what happens, mm. what, like, what does failure look like? That's the thing we really don't know is, mm. uh, you know, like what, what, what is that? What happens when the drive fails? How, or, or what happens when the file system fails? Like with, with HFS plus, we kind of got to know, yeah, okay. You can live a little and, and get some data off it. Then you're still okay. Like we don't, like we just don't know with APFS yet. So, all right. Well, we had some tips come in from, uh, from some previous shows. So I wanted to share some of those, John, unless, uh, is there more on APFS to, to go through no. here? All right. Okay. Uh, then we will go to gray who says in 744, you were discussing situations in which cookies might be blocked or purged on sites requiring them, such as online banking pages. John mentioned ad blockers, which can indeed interfere with recognition and function of secure sites, such as banking, airlines, etc. 
If you open the website in question, go to the menu bar, Safari settings for this website and uncheck the box, enable content blockers, your ad blockers won't get in the way. So that's pretty good. I had no idea that you could do this. So get to a website um, and then uh, in the menu bar, Safari settings for this website. How do we do that? Is that something? Huh? I don't know where he's doing. I'm trying to do this on my own. I see the image that, that he sent to us. Can you do this, John? Like it, it, he's, it looks like he's, I did it once. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know where settings for this website is. If you open the website in question. Uh, no. All right. Go to a web page. Yeah. Ready? I, oh, I see it, and I see I see it, it again okay. in the Safari menu. It says settings for this website. And this is a it. new edition. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's new in Safari, but I think it's there. I think it's Safari 12. I mean, it's, it's on my high Sierra yes. machine too. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. And right. We can see it shows us things like, um, uh, this, what he mentioned, enable content blockers. You can set a website to use reader when available. So it would show you in mm. reader view all the time. Uh, you can set a default page, page zoom. You can choose your autoplay settings for, uh, for media, right? Stop media with sound, allow, never play. You can choose whether pop-ups are allowed, <sighs> camera, microphone, location. That actually, I got to put that in place because the one time that this always happens. So I don't know why this is, Dave, but you know, because I live near the water, I got to pay an exorbitant amount for flood insurance. Sure. And the, the and FEMA manages this sort of thing. But the thing is, the website that I go to to pay it every year, it always uses a pop-up sure. for me to enter at first, I was like, what's wrong with this site? It's like, I, I want to give you my money. I legally have to because right. otherwise my bank will yell at me. Um, so I got to get flood insurance. And and eventually I figured out and I think I, I ran one browser and it said, uh, yeah, I'm blocking this pop up. I'm like, oh, gee, what could this pop up be? Oh, it's yeah. the dialogue that asks for my credit card or payment you know way to pay but but it was like why you bought why uh, number one why are you using this to right. ask me for money <laughs> because don't you know that a lot of browsers are like pop-ups are evil <laughs> so and they don't so this is so. interesting because you you can control each of these you can th this is the way of looking at it from the web page which is super handy by the way i just want to point that out but you can look at it the other way from the feature. If you go into Safari preferences websites and you say go to the content blockers section there where you can control whether your websites use your content blockers or you can go to uh, pop up windows. Right. Which is also there in Safari um, preferences websites. You go to pop up windows and then you can choose to let the websites open or not open uh, those things. So you can, you can configure this one of one of two ways. I had no idea, obviously that you could do it this way. So that that's a good one. Safari settings for this website. Thank you, gray. Very good stuff. Very, very good. See, this is how we learn stuff. And that makes this show excellent. Uh, while we're on that subject, John, uh, we did hear back from Leslie or less. Uh, I think it's Leslie actually, but, um, he wrote back and said, uh, I, I had suggested as we kind of kept going through this, go to system preferences, privacy, manage website data. Oh, uh, wait, wait, wait. No, sorry. Wrong place. Go into Safari. I had the wrong thing. If you go to Safari privacy, there is a checkbox there that says block all cookies. And for less, it was checked. And that's why. All of those problems were happening. Banks weren't remembering him. Websites wouldn't remember him. He couldn't save logins, those sorts of things. Block all cookies was checked. Uncheck that hmm. box and problems go away. We knew it was cookies related. We just couldn't quite get there. And we, we stayed at it and he stayed at it. He found it. Block all cookies was checked. So Safari preferences, privacy. There it is right there. Pretty good, huh? Craziness. Crazy, crazy. I like it when yeah. we can find all these things that we can all learn. It's good. Yeah, I don't know if you can really block. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know how I feel about that choice. You can't block all cookies. I mean, well, no, you can, and it causes major problems. As well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Saying, well, you can, yes, yes. But, but it's 
probably not a good, good, probably not a good idea. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I like cookies. You like cookies. No, doesn't everybody like cookies? Cookies are good. Cookies are good. They make life easier on the web and they're tasty. So I like, I like peanut butter is my favorite. Well, there you go. That's everybody now knows. Send John peanut butter. All right. uh, How about you? What's your favorite? Oh, chocolate chip for me. Uh, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I have a very, like, very, very mild peanut allergy. Um, so oh. much so that I didn't realize it until about five years ago. But um, yeah, it's 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 really not. It, it's just minor anaphylaxis. I I if I'm dehydrated and I have peanuts, uh-huh. I I feel like a tightening in my throat. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just like just like a little bit, not anything that's ever been a problem. And or, if I'm um, eating peanuts regularly, I don't notice it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Or how about or my second favorite. Actually, maybe my first favorite oatmeal raisin. Oh, there you go. Okay. So now, now people raisins. have, people have options. An oatmeal, right? It's healthy. It's got oatmeal and raisins. Sure it is. What could be better? Sure it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Going to Joe from show 743. He says there was a gentleman that was cleaning an airport by spraying compressed air to clean out the rest. Uh, he says it is assumed from the description that the air was being blown into the device. And as such, this is really not the best approach. Ideally, one would want to blow air away from the internals of the device, not into the internals of the device. The reason for this is that the dust then collects around the device, increasing the temperature and ultimately shortening the life of the device. The dust could act as an insulator is what uh what listener Joe is, is telling us here. So yeah, if you, you, you can certainly try and take things apart to blow air across them, but if you are going to blow it in from the outside, try and do it in such a way that the dust actually leaves and doesn't just get blown around inside the devices. Right. Is, is I just, mean, I would think most of these things come with a, a small long tube that you put in the, uh, output of the compressed air that's true and i would think if you can get that inside of the device so that you can then navigate that you're going to blow the dust out instead of in yes it's a it's a good point though i'm kind of step back and say uh, moving uh, anything that moves the dust around is probably a good thing though though but I, I do understand his point well the thing is i'm, I'm thinking the chances that you're going to make things worse by using air from the outside to get the stuff, the dust out. Me, you see where I'm going. I, yeah, here? his point's valid, though. I mean, if you if if there is a spot, I mean, you, could make, you could you could indeed make it worse by blowing the dust. If there's onto one spot other that catches, of, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. But also make sure it's unplugged. I, even if it's unplugged, I I oh, remember back in the day. Um, that we had at computer nerds. Now this is probably, you know, 25 years ago or something, but, uh, Sean, one of our guys was, you know, blowing out a motherboard and wound up shorting the motherboard because there was so much dust on there that as the dust moved, that that our theory was that as the dust moved, it actually caused static, uh, electricity to move Mm -hmm. along with it. And then, then, you know, that was, it let the magic smoke out of the motherboard and that was the end. So, yeah. (sighs) I mean, the one other thing I'll mention about compressed air, which you got to be careful with, is because it's compressed gas, when it leaves the device, it's going to be very cold. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get this too close to a circuit board, because if it gets too cold, it'll crack. You're going to break it. Yeah. You're going to break your circuits. So uh, th- that that's the only other thing I'd add is maintain your distance with compressed air. I mean, you'll even see it. I mean, if you look closely, you'll see frost develop on the things that you spray it on. And if you want to do it on your skin, um, well, no, I, I would say don't do that. Right. right. <laughs> so if you want to feel the effect of compressed air on your skin, go for it. It's just to make a frostbite and hurt yourself. So don't do that. Yeah, no, I wouldn't right? recommend it. No, it's not good. It's not good. All right. One last one. And then uh, and then I think I'm going to give my throat a rest for the day if uh, if that's okay with everybody. But uh, listener Robert wrote in and asked, he says, I remember hearing you guys talk about how nice the thing box was uh, a year or so ago. He says, I'm considering picking one up and was hoping for an update on your opinion regarding a slightly above average network security box that won't cost a bunch. He says, I have ubiquity routers, switches and Wi-Fi access points and would like something a bit more automatic than pouring through my GitLab server logs for attempted root logins. Any input would be nice. And thanks for doing such a great job. Uh, you're welcome, Robert. Thanks for saying that. Um, 
it, yeah, I really like this thing box. It's it's super. It's exactly what you said. It's super simple. Um, it sits on the network. It it monitors. I, I would say it monitors in a passive sense in that it it doesn't require all the traffic to route through it, but it it sits there and figures everything out. And when a new device joins the network, I am alerted immediately. If you know one of my kids friends comes over and joins with a you know a, uh, their phone or if anybody in the house gets a new phone or whatever instantly on my on my phone is where i have the notifications and also in my email it shows up and it says yep here you go once a week it sends me a report telling me what new ports have been opened on my router right uh, with because i i allow upnp on my network i know i know i know but i know that's why i allow right. it and uh, and Thingbox tells me what new ports have been opened this week. Um, it'll it, I, it it's really quite fantastic. It it'll you know it tells me who's home when they've been home because I can say okay you know for Dave this iPhone is the device that follows Dave everywhere. That iPhone follows Lisa, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it checks my speeds. It will identify devices that are bandwidth hogs and I, like it. And, and, and then of course all the security and intrusion stuff too. It, it monitors all that stuff and, and will tell me about it. Now, the one thing I've noticed, Dave, as of late, and you may have too, if you have Eero plus is Eero has recently added new device notifications. I, Yes. Notification the other day. It was like, oh, by the way, you want you want to know when devices I haven't seen before join the network? And it's like, hey, that's like Fingbox. So yeah. they're taking a step in that direction. Yes. Ab oh, absolutely. Which is nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if you have an Eero, you're getting most of this stuff already now as part of your, you know, Eero and or Eero Plus subscription. Um, if you don't. Uh, yeah, the thing plus for that, or was that well for the intrusion feature? protection and, and that sort of thing? Yes. Well, the new device thing, was that a plus no, feature? No, that's no? not a plus feature. No, no, oh, no, 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 that's, that's just, just a feature. Yeah. That's just okay. a feature. Cool. Yeah. 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 So yeah, no, the thing box is great. It's a hundred bucks and like super easy. And, and I, you know, to, to Robert's point, like what he described is exactly what I love it for. I have a super geeky network set up here to, uh, far more complex than anyone would actually need, but I like it. <laughs> but, but I like, I also like to have this sort of, you know, watchdog that sits there and tells me what's going on without me having to like pour through logs and, and do all of that crazy stuff. And Fingbox does that. It's, and it just sits there happily and it'll tell me when my internet connection has gone down and come back up. Uh, it, you know, it just keeps track of all sorts of things. But that, but that makes sense because the one event that you probably want to know about immediately is what is this? What? Yeah. New device. Who are you? What happened? Who are you? <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Exactly. That you're totally yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It could be your kid being like, Oh yeah. No, uh, yeah. Most that. of the time it's like the device that, you know, it shows me what the device calls itself too. Uh, in the notification. And so it's like, oh, okay. yeah, well, you see Jimmy's you know, iPhone and it's like, oh, OK, well, perfect. Jimmy's, uh, you know, the 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 friend. That so, makes perfect okay. sense. Yep, exactly. But if it's something else, it's like, wow, well, wait, what's this? It they just know really you may want to, to put know. those interlopers on a guest network. I don't know if I trust uh, these strange kids on my home network, you know? Yeah, you know I've, I've, I yes, I do. <laughs> You're not wrong. Um, it, it would be. Yeah, it would be a pain in the neck. The problem with with well, Apple does not make this easy. Your friend wants to share content, in which case, then okay, you can be on the home. Network well, but here's the them. other problem, right? The friend shows up, uh, opens up the phone, and says, "Oh, cool, there's your network." And then another friend, or you know, one of my kids, gets a notification on their phone saying, "Hey, do you want to share the password with that person?" It's like, yeah, okay, cool. So. Mm -hmm. Unless everyone in the house is super diligent about this, you're not going to get all the guests just on the guest network. I, I haven't right, had right, a problem right. with it yet, but, but there is a, you make a very good point. It's, it's, you know, yeah. Yeah. Cause it, then it means my Wi-Fi password is on lots of devices that are not me. Uh, mm -hmm. Plume makes this easy or easier to deal with because with Plume, you can have one Wi-Fi network with different passwords and different uh, permissions assigned what? to those passwords. Why not? Plume, what's Plume? Plume, Plume is the, the mesh Wi-Fi that, uh, that I've been testing here for, I don't know, from, last year or whatever. 
from, from Plume. Plume. Oh, it's Plume. We, yeah. We talked about oh, them. Yeah, no, they're they're like they, they 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 them and I've mentioned this several times on the show. Them Plume and Eero are the two, in my opinion, competing for the top spot in terms of mesh Wi-Fi for you know the the home user. Huh? Plume and and in many ways, uh, you know, and that's the thing when when I say they're competing, in some ways Plume is is better, in some ways Eero is better. Um, Plume's hardware is better. It's it's a it's tri band hardware, and one of two of the bands are two by two, just like Eero, and then the th- the second five gigahertz band or the third band is a four by four, and it will use it simultaneously for backhaul, but also for front haul, so that if you've got like a MacBook Pro or an iMac, you can actually connect with three by three and and get killer bandwidth out of this thing it's great the management oh, interface is awesome um the super pods just <clears throat> while we're here just to make sure plume has their original gen stuff and then uh last year they released their super pods that's we, we didn't start looking at it until they had their super pods i did not like their original gen stuff i, I was not impressed with it i huh? when i when i encounter it i am still not impressed the software is the same like the software is great but in terms of hardware and range and stuff, it just wasn't wasn't yeah, fantastic. Look at that. Super so pods on their are awesome. Site, guests coming to visit with Home Pass, you can create a Wi Fi password unique to them. Yes. Wow. Right. Yeah. I haven't heard that before. It's yeah. pretty cool. Well, you have, but you just didn't know it. Well, I've because I've said it here. Yeah. But yes. Fair. Oh, I'm sure you have. I was just yeah. doing something else. You were doing something else. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Plume is plume. Plume is just like that. They're not part of like somebody else. No, they are Plume. Now they've partnered. They're, they're, they're not a part of like you know some corporate you know conglomerate or something. I mean, I'm, I'm no. sure they're using chips from Broadcom or who, uh, Qualcomm or is who makes all the the mesh chips. Uh, right these days, really? Yeah, I thought there was uh-huh. another player. No, everything's space. Qualcomm. They, their booth really? at CES yeah. just has like. In fact, last year oh. at CES, I think they pre-announced like the the new Deco or something because they were like, uh-huh. here's all the cool things that use. Uh, or maybe it was the Asus stuff. I don't know, but they, they uh-huh. had a, you know, in their booth, they're like, here's all the cool things that all the mesh that uses Qualcomm mesh. And it's like, I've never seen that device before. And it's like, Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. Oops. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh plumes. Fantastic. It really, really well done. They have an interesting pricing model with their, you can either buy a subscription or, uh, you, you know, but, uh-huh. um, but no, it's, uh, it's fantastic. It really, really rock solid stuff. Uh, they know what they're doing. So yeah, all highly right. recommended. So, all right. Well, that's, uh, that's what I got here, my friend. And so we really didn't cut this show short at all. Did we? It's uh, just how it goes. It's fine. The usual. It's all good. I had to hit the, the cough button the a few times. We tell you okay. how to, what's that? I had to hit the cough button a few times, but that's okay. Oh, my. That's why we, that's why we have the uh, mute switch. You know, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I got one on my mic. I know you really like that. Uh, yeah, d- doesn't your mic make a lot of no. noise when you hit that button, though? Uh, hold uh, on. Go, go ahead and hit it, it. Let's hear. Yeah. And I'm on. Yeah. It's a mechanical switch. Yeah, we heard it. Yeah, you, you'll hear it when you listen back. It's 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 too conspicuous. No. Yeah. I, I know you had a fish shake about the switch on this mic. I think it's the wrong position. Oh, is that right? Well, no, I think you said to me, it's like, well, what position do switches go in to turn things off, up or down? And we, we, we were having a spare. Oh, discussion. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't like switches on mics anyway. They, they just they cause more trouble than good. You well, know, yeah, because they make noise. Well, mm-hmm. and like the only time that I've ever heard that I've ever thought about a switch on a microphone is after 10 minutes of troubleshooting and trying to figure out why there's no signal coming from a mic. <laughs> and somebody says, oh, the switch is off. Well, what the? <laughs> you know, why is that? Okay, uh, let's unwire that switch in that mic. Let's just do that, and then we won't ever have this problem again. It's cool. So you're you're all for open mic, I guess. I am all for open mic. Yeah, we can mute it elsewhere, yeah. and in a much more um, right. You know, yes, it's a much better way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because right. if you mute it there, what happens is if you're using an app that's like. Um, uh, you know, like Skype or Discord or something where it the app is monitoring your input signal, especially if you're doing it without headphones on, like in a conference call type environment. Uh, it's constantly trying to figure out how much gain to give it before echo happens. And it can hear the echo when you're not talking, right? It can, it can suss that out. Well, if you mute that mic, 
it thinks that it can't hear anything and it'll gain it uh. way up. Then you turn it on and everybody's like, oh man, everything's echoing. Like, it's just a bad idea. It's just a bad idea. That's crazy. All right. So we told you about the email. What else do we have? You know, we got we got premium. The Twitter. Premium at MacGeekGab.com oh, for premium course. listeners. And uh, sure, tell them about Twitter, John. I'm John F. Ron. He's Dave Hamilton. The podcast is Mac Geek Gab. The publication is Mac Observer. That guy who's flying around somewhere is Pilot Pete. That is All true. All at Twitter.com. So and visit our visit our forums, MacGeekGab.com slash forums. All yeah, good. Your Twitter's going away. What's that? Uh, oh, is it? And Facebook, so and Instagram. I don't think they're going away. No, I see. I, it's weird. I've been seeing some people in our feed. Uh, one person that you and I both know. I don't know if you've seen, uh, but she's like, uh, I'm I'm ditching uh, Facebook and Instagram. Oh, I see that all the time. Oh yeah, sure. That's that happens. It's fine because I don't like them because they did something bad. We ditched like, Facebook because eh. we didn't like them for the forums, and now you just go to the forums. Well, for the forums, yeah, it makes but the way thing more is for sense. Personal. You know, birthday and event, and you know, seeing what your friends and family are up to. I'm, I'm still. Uh, yeah, I, me too. But I also get that that's exactly why some people find Facebook entirely creepy is because of exactly the things you just said. It knows everything. Some people oh, yeah. don't want that. Oh, I'm yeah. with you, man. I mean, yeah. there, there are some people that you know. I would try to friend that were like, you know, people that I knew back in high school, and you know, some of them were probably like. Who is this guy after like, you know, for a years, long time, you could, years. you could type in someone's <laughs> cell phone number into Facebook and it would it would show uh, them. I don't think that works anymore. So that was a pretty creepy way to find somebody's Facebook account. Just oh, type in their cell number. I'm sure they've I'm sure they've associated. it. Yeah, I, that worked up until about a year ago. So. All right, folks, that's uh, uh, that's yeah. how we're going to do it here. It's uh, the show. The what? show must end, John. It's just how it goes. I want to thank our sponsors, expressvpn.com slash MGG, linkedin.com slash MGG. Of course, all the folks in the podcast marketplace, uh, opsgenie.com, eero.com slash MGG, barebones, smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, otherworld computing at macsales.com. Indeed. Have a great week. Take care of yourself. Have fun. Send us your cool stuff found because we've got some coming up next week and by all means do everything you possibly can to make sure that you don't get caught. Made